Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Stebbins. Uh, thank you all for attending this lecture at the Institute of World Politics. Yeah. For those of you who are new, uh, IDP is a graduate school of uh, national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of studies, and a new doctoral program. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about this, please uh, feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of the event. Um, it's my pleasure uh, very much today to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Lambrow, who's an assistant professor for intelligence studies at Mercyhurst University, the current U.S. representative at ARAG Institute. Uh, Dr. Lambrow currently works with recently founded U.S. nonprofit organizations, uh, such as ARAG, which focuses on strengthening ties in East Asia through people-to-people -people diplomacy. His work in Korea as the sole bureau chief of the ARAG Institute has resulted in grabbing the attention of national Korean media, where they, were, where they were the subject of two documentaries. He currently writes and appears for Korean news outlets as an expert on culture and inter-Korean relations. His academic work focuses on the application of machine learning methods and text analytics, both supervised and unsupervised, to analyze patterns in North Korean news outlets and provide predictive modeling of North Korean provocations. He was recently recognized in 2018 by local, national, international media outlets, and we're very happy uh, to have him here today. Uh, thank you very much. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. We'll work on your Arirang pronunciation. My career is not quite as good as yours. We'll get it there. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, thank you to the uh, Institute of World Politics staff for organizing and, and having me today. Uh, you know, I'm excited to be here. I'm always excited to do lectures or seminars or events, as you can see from the uh, biography. And uh, because of the recent events and ongoing events and the importance of the Korean Peninsula, uh, geopolitically, locally, uh, DC locally, you know, that uh, resonates. Um, you know, we thought it would be important to have an event, right? And so I'm going to go through a bit of my background, uh, just so you understand where I'm coming from and for all those graduates. How many graduates? We have a lot of graduate students here. Undergraduate students? I know you're pain. All right. Uh, there's hope. Uh, you got to hustle. We all have to hustle. And hopefully my story will, at the beginning, will give you a little bit of inspiration on, on uh, some nice places to focus your hustle, and then how I was able to sort of uh, launch a little bit uh, when I was over in Korea. So I don't have a clicker, but uh, just look towards the background. So I did graduate from Mercyhurst University 2006 with in the uh, Intelligence Studies degree. Uh, I was a Korean linguist in the U.S. Army for four years. So I wasn't the best student, but a mid-level student, and I knew I had to get a security clearance, I knew I had to get a language, and I didn't really have the discipline to teach myself. So I joined the military, my father's military, military family, and uh, it was just part of you know the duty of our family and everybody we knew that you had to join the military. And I joined the army, I was a Korean linguist, went to DLI, it was a great experience, and learning Korean did change my life, right? So it did not only expand how I thought about the world, how I thought about politics and culture, but it also gave me a new perspective, and that perspective is what I'm here to share with you today, uh, as you saw from the title. We'll get back to the title. So I went to Korea on my GI Bill, uh, I did my master's degree, and I was about to come back via, what would you call it, defense contractor, security clearance, the whole nine, you know, that whole, uh, say, path. And somebody approached me and asked me to attend the University of North Korean Studies, which, if you don't know, is a specialty school in South Korea, uh, near the Blue House, uh, the Chongwade, sorry, the Blue House. And it's a very small private institution where they train and educate their entire, everybody in their government on North Korea. That's where they go. There are other institutions, whether it's a Korea University or Yonsei, that, are, that have popped up, but this was, I believe, it was the original. It's also known as IFAS. Uh, Institute of Far East Studies, I think, uh, related to Kyungnam University. All right, so this is, I didn't know the school existed, actually. I didn't know the school existed until they told me, and because I spoke Korean, the classes were taught in Korean, the coursework was taught in Korean, they said, hey, you might have a shot of uh, finishing, completing the coursework. And so I interviewed, everything was in Korean, the coursework was in Korean, and I did my uh, PhD there. So I'm just now returning and uh, well, I'm here to share with you uh, that experience. Uh, so you have the U.S. Korean linguist. Uh, while doing the NGO work, the NGO work was also sort of an accident. I was trying to work on base. I was trying to get a job. 
And somebody said, why don't we start an NGO? And I thought that's a bit ambitious, but okay. And we started speaking to all our friends at the University of North Korea Studies and the folks uh, in and around Seoul community. And that's the institute we came up with. I did not come up with the name Arirang. It was suggested uh, because of its importance, uh, because of its historical importance, its cultural importance. And if you don't know, how many know the name Arirang? For those of you who don't know, it's considered the unofficial national anthem of Korea, the Korean people. Uh, it's a folk song. It's one of the oldest songs in Korean history, if not the oldest song. There's many different versions according to regions, which, which part of the country you go to. Uh, so while doing the work, I worked with uh, Mumang Cho, which is a big NGO that does work for resettlement of North Korean refugees. Uh, they do everything from teaching them English to getting them education. So if you're looking for an organization to get connected with and work with, I helped Fulbright scholars, I helped foreign scholars when I was over there, because despite your foreign scholarship, you still can't speak Korean. So you need somebody like me to help you interview with the North Korean refugees. Well, some of you can speak Korean, but for the most part, American students that go over there, they want to interview, they want to work with the North Korean refugees, but uh, they have trouble with uh, the language barrier. Jung Ilbo uh, will be a part of the focus today. Do you guys know who Jung Ilbo is, the organization? Yeah, it's called uh, Jo Jung Dong, which is uh, Cho San Ilbo, Jung Ilbo, and Dong Ilbo. The top three uh, mainstream media outlets, you can think about them as the New York Times, the Washington Post, and LA Times. If I'm off base on that, then my Korean friends can uh, correct me later. Uh, Radio Free Asia, I think everybody knows who that is, and National Language Service Corps, if you're interested in that, you can contact them, sign up, and they also have uh, a nice network. And of course, Mercyhurst University. So I'm gonna go forward. Uh, this is some of the recognition we got. I would like to point out, and I'll point out throughout the presentation, almost most of our support, if not all of our support, came from Korea, not Western uh, media outlets. Uh, it was English media outlets, it was mostly Korean outlets. Most of my support came from people who couldn't speak English, but they spoke Korean. All right, this was why I was in Korea. All right, so I hope this isn't too provocative, but here you have an overlay of, does anybody know what this is overlay? What's behind the, the three individuals here? Do you know what the background is? Did you say a launch? Yeah, I hope that's not a, looks like a, like this a launch. Uh, yeah, the candlelight revolution. A lot of you remember the candlelight revolution? How short our attention spans are. Does anybody know the candlelight revolution? Does anybody know what it was about? What was the reasoning behind it? Um, it was to oust um, for representation. Yes. Um, a peaceful protest. Peaceful protest, yes. Okay. So President Park, we have President Boone now. But before we had President Park, and she was peacefully removed for demonstrations, weekly demonstrations throughout the country, I think for six months. It was from like August to February or until the election, right, which was the, in the spring when President Moon was elected. Uh, and so this presentation is about how uh, it was the Korean people, right, it was the Korean media, Korean people, Korean businesses, Korean community that's been driving. Uh, these new efforts for, uh, what would you say, peace and prosperity on the peninsula, Trump uh, and everybody else in the community is just, I wouldn't say along for the ride, but if President Trump or the U.S. foreign policy expert community, they are sort of having to start to understand just how much of a desire and movement this is, right, for the Korean people. I'm going to go ahead and go forward. All right, so here's a, a little bit of a timeline that's probably hard to read for some of you. So I only went back to 2016, you had a nuclear test, and then every, then you had sanctions starting to get tighter, the closing of Gaysong Factory. Everybody know what Gaysong Factory was? Gaysong? No? no? It's a joint economic initiative between the North and the South, and a lot of folks, and rightly so, they shut down the factory, right? But what people don't think about in the U.S. is, I think it was some, there was 500 or hundreds of small businesses in South Korea were affected by this. They didn't get their money back. I know lots of them, business owners, these are presidents, these aren't the Chebos, these aren't the Samsungs, these aren't the Hyundais. These are the people right below them that have big businesses, that people's lives depend on them, 
and they were severely hurt by that. And the business community is struggling. Uh, we'll, we'll go through that in the next couple of slides. But basically, you have the global downturn, right? Economic downturn, 2008 financial crisis, global downturn, for his suffers, uh, looking for a way out. And then you have these, these moves to move away from economic integration with the North, and small businesses were severely affected. Uh, you have plans for announced intelligence sharing with the US and Japan. Uh, for most of you that know about the politics in East Asia, you understand why this might be a little bit controversial and used uh, to incite a lot of uh, discontent. But more importantly, you have the THAAD deployment was finalized. Now we all know what THAAD is, right? THAAD is huge as a symbolic, uh, as a symbol of the US Rock Alliance in my opinion, all right? But the deployment of THAAD, this missile defense system, in reaction to North Korea's nuclear test, the Chinese have been sanctioning. In my opinion, there's, there, you might call them hidden sanctions, but they've been punishing the South Korean businesses and government for this action. And they do that by reducing tourism, reducing the amount of international students that, that go to South Korea. And I think there's one more. Oh, I have it in the upcoming slides. Uh, cultural products. So one of the main, one of Korea's new exports is cultural products, whether it's how you, uh, Korean dramas, Korean movies, well, these are blocked. What's one big thing they sell during commercials of these dramas? Makeup, cosmetics, big business. That's blocked. All right, so there's real, there's repercussions to uh, bad deployment, uh, setting down of Kaesong, and this rising of tensions in Korea, uh, I think a lot of you might know the phrase, when the whales fight, the shrimp get crushed. That's often the, the phrase that's used, the terminology is used. So they feel really stuck sometimes. All right? And then you have Trump comes along with the President Trump or President-elect Trump or President-to-be Trump, and he's talking about, well, we're going to renegotiate the FTA. We're going to uh, make it more difficult to do business, America first. And so there's a lot of worry and concern in the South Korean business community and going forward, what I think is there was a collective decision to get rid of these sort of antagonistic attempts or these sort of yeah, antagonistic policies toward China and North Korea and to work for some sort of economic inspiration, right? some sort of way to do business. Right? Because right now, the South Korean economy is really looking for a path forward. Otherwise, it's going to continue to, uh, it, will, it will stagnate. All right, so we fast forward to the October 24th. You have the JTBC broadcast. That may or may not be the exact date. I'm pretty sure it is. And this is the tablet. Now, you guys know the tablet? No? No tablet? All right, so this is the reason I believe that uh, the, the candlelight demonstrations were sparked, and I'll get into it. We have, uh, it's the economy stupid. I should take the term stupid out. It's the economy, and so you have, these are recent articles, but ousting the president won't fix South Korea's economy. Uh, South Korea injects 2.7 billion to reduce jobless youth. So South Korea, like J Japan, the youth aren't getting married. The youth are having big pro problems getting, uh, what would you consider, regular employment. All right. So full-time employment is very difficult to get currently. Uh, so you have stagnating global economy, national economy, economic sandwich between Japan and China, high youth unemployment, low marriage rates. And I think President Moon announced an initiative to support young couples. He just announced it, all right, to try to speak to this. He's also announcing other plans uh, of basic income, but it's to address this growing concern. Because think about it, if you're in the leadership, whether you're left or right, the growing concern is econo the economy is bad. People are struggling. What do we have to What are we going to do? All right. What are we going to do? And so uh, all of these youth are struggling. Uh, a lot of you know about Korea. You know that you have to take a test in high school. All right. What is, what's the importance of this test? Is it just college? Is it just employment? It's your rest of your life, right? It's a decisive moment in a lot of people's lives that determines what part, what class they're going to be in almost, right? In the U.S., we don't like to think about classes because we like to think there are no classes. But in other parts of the world, uh, it's very, very hard to climb the socioeconomic ladder. And one way that there is a system-based merit that's introduced in South Korea is through the testing system, right? So the 
The lawyers, they have to take tests. They have to study for years, decades, to take these tests to pass them. Civil servants. The high school students, the same thing. So then when you have these people studying, we could see them in the cafes, you could see them in the cram school, you can see them learning English, you can see them, uh, you know, blood, sweat, tears, all the money goes into these students to learn, to take these tests, to pass the test at a certain rate, to get into college, to get into university for a better life. And then you have the scandal. Do you guys know who Trey Sung Trey Sung Shia was? She's the tablet that was discovered. Now I know there's talk about there wasn't a tablet, there isn't a tablet, but it doesn't matter in the media, in the media it's about perception. Okay. Uh, so on the tablet that this anchor broke, I forget his name, he's, he's quite famous in Korea right now. JTBC is uh, used to be part of Jumai Ilbo, if not still part of Jumai Ilbo. Uh, Trey Sung Shil's tablet, and then in there at the bottom it talks about how the, she was editing the president's speeches. All right, so this is a woman without any credentials. She didn't take any tests. She didn't pass any tests. She was just the president's lifelong friend, and she was having access to secret documents or presidential documents, and she was having say in the government. Right? So that's one reason you get this really, really, really uh, public outcry in the streets. The, the next part, does anybody know what I might point to next as one of the reasons for public outcry that's related to Trey Sun Xiu? Did she even take the test? I heard rumors that she didn't even take the, she didn't pass the test at a high enough level or she didn't even take the high school test to get into university. Not only that, she didn't even attend class. She rode her horse in Germany and got straight A's the whole time. All right, and then you think, okay, well, so this is the daughter, Jong Yura, and she was called back, she came back, and then they're both, they're both in big time trouble. Uh, and this is, a lot of times, people in D.C., people in Washington, D.C., they get this perception that, oh, the, the candlelight movement or the mass demonstrations are anti-U.S. In my opinion, they're not anti-U.S. They might be anti-corruption, they might be upset with the system uh, that President Park represents, but this, I think, this is the real reason you had such an outcry and outpouring in the streets, mostly among young people who were struggling, you know, to get a leg up, and then they turn around and they go, oh, you know, Oh, it's rigged. You can't do anything. So that's uh, one reason for today's talk is to dispel the myth that some people might claim that these are anti-American protests. They're not. In my opinion, they're not. All right. So the mass peaceful demonstrations are not anti-U.S. They reflect uh, economic and political discontent, and they reflect a desire for change. So the South Korean government, if you're the leader of South Korea or the leadership of South Korea and you have this massive youth unemployment, you're looking for a way out. You can no longer make things cheaper and faster because that's what China's doing. Uh, what would you call it? Uh, high investment, high tech products, Japan does, and so you're caught what's called economic sandwich, right? It's very difficult. Uh, and so the desire change, and if you talk to Korean business people, most small Korean business people would say, working with North Korea, on some level, is our only path. Now, I know there's a lot of negative sentiment in North South Korea, and it's all well-founded, and it's all very important to talk about, but I'm talking about people trying to, you know, make their businesses work, they're trying to improve their lives, and the Korean economic, or the Korean business community, from what I understood when I was over there, sees North Korean uh, labor, North, uh, working together with North Korea, building the infrastructure of North Korea, whether it's uh, railways or streets or roads or the electric grid or gas grids, uh, this could be an economic stimulus for uh, the next, well, they talk about the next hundred years, but the next, at least the next couple of decades. I actually visited these and they were peaceful. There was no, hey, there's a, a foreigner, let's beat them up. There was none of that. It was very nice. It was more of a, a concert, rock concert type atmosphere. In fact, there were rock concerts there. They had concerts. It did get a little bit scary when, after they would do the demonstrations, which goes all the way sort of down the street in Bangamon, they would walk this way. So this is the Tungbuku Palace, the Blue House is back here. They would walk this way to the Supreme Court. 
which is actually where my university is, it's over there in the hills. Uh, they would walk this way, and one time I left, I was about here in the front, I walked that way to go home to the subway station over there, Yakub Station, and I turned around and there were all these people walking towards me, and I, I was a little scared then, but uh, they were just walking to the Supreme Court and they'd just say, you know, get rid of Park, they would protest. Uh, there are what would you might call leftist organizations or nationalist organizations that try to spin it as if it were anti-American, right? And they try to uh, take pictures and say, this is what the movement's about, this is the reason for the movement. And there might be a small element, maybe 10 to 15% of paid protesters that are there, that are there to provide that spin. But the, in my opinion, the majority of the folks, the young people, the students that were there were, were just sort of, they were just upset about the uh, perceived corruption. All right, so we have the President Moon elected. We have the Pyeongchang Olympics with North Korea. And we have the summit and then the second summit. Uh, all right. Now I, do, I do data analysis. Uh, and in this next part, I'm going to talk about how you can use, I collected, I think this is over 40 something news outlets from around the world, compile them into a database using the search term North Korea. So these are maybe. 40 news outlets, a couple hundred thousand articles from February 1st to about June 25th, I believe. And then we analyze them for sentiment scores, which is a basic APN sentiment scores in our studio. And then the visualization is done in Tableau. And you can see at the top there, there's sort of a timeline. The blue is positive, the red is negative. And then here you have your, I mean, this is just for the entire uh, time period that I grabbed. This is, you know, Pravda, Radio Free Asia, Press TV, Press TV is an Iranian uh, outlet, The Economist, Huffington Post, RT, New York Times, Fox News, The Guardian, LA Times. On average, the articles are negative. And then you can see down here, you have the uh, Korea Jumon Daily, which is Jumon Yobo's English version. Uh, the Diplomats, for those of you uh, graduate students, you probably know what the Diplomat is. Uh, Audiodong.com, Yonhap News. Yonhap News is more of a, it's like an AP. It's more than the AP, but it's, it's Korea's fast news uh, wire service. NK News, Korea Times, Korea Herald, Boston Globe, USA Today, uh, and then some others. And so this, it goes back to the beginning when I spoke about is the Korean media outlets are overwhelmingly positive, right, in almost all of their reporting. Uh, I haven't done this yet in Korean, and I would imagine the topics would differ, but I would probably suspect that they would also be overwhelmingly positive. Now, there are a couple reasons for this that we can go into later. Uh, some of them are structural. When there's a new president, there's often new presidents of institutions. Uh, but in my experience in Korea, the, there's unification, or at least being for the peace process, is the one political issue you can't be against. You can be against what type of unification, you can be against uh, the form, the speed, the manner in which it's done, but the dream or the belief that unification should one day happen, most people agree that it should one day happen, it's just a matter of when, how, and you know, who's in charge. All right, and so in that case, when somebody does a peace overture, the North or the South, there sort of has to be this, at least attempt to be uh, worked together. All right, even if the leadership doesn't want it, they still have to work, at least attempt to work towards it. Are we okay? All right. All right, so in my opinion, that's, that's a big reason why the, the news outlets are overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive in this respect, in this regard. And you spilled water on everything. Uh, this is just, I'll, I'll give this to the, the staff and then they can upload it or something. But this is just another kind of data uh, representation of the sentiment score across time, and you can see reporting in the media, this is the 47 or so news outlets that I whittled it down to, was more positive for the North and South Summit than it was for the US North Korea Summit. And as you can see, it's also positive for the Olympics, it's positive for when Trump agrees to meet him, and then you have the negative spike here when, when President Park has been sentenced to prison. I spoke about President Park up in Erie, and the negative consequences of political retribution, like the vicious cycle of retribution politics. Uh, but I'm not going to go with that. That's a different talk for a different time. So. Uh, 
This is topic modeling analysis. I don't think I want to have more time for questions, so I'm just going to push through this. But topic modeling analysis basically takes a corpus, a text of data, or a text of uh, a database of text. So if you had 100,000 news articles, you said divide up those news articles into five categories for me, sort of a clustering algorithm, and then it says, okay, these are the five different topics that we found. We found there was a big topic that talked about the Olympics, a topic that talked about summits, a topic that talked about the Iran deal, China trade, and just negative U.S. domestic politics in general. Uh, and then this is a representation of those topics over time. All right, so this is the last part. How many of you guys know about Google Trends? You know Google Trends? It's a great resource, if you don't know. It's a free resource. Uh, it measures interest in the topic based off of the search term. So in this case, the US media is quite Americans, American media, Western media. We have very short attention spans. We're not talking about Korea anymore. What are we talking about? What's the topic of the day in DC? Immigration. Or separating families. Or the kids in the cave. Right, saving the kids in uh, the cave. And so in Google Trends is a useful tool. You can set it to the United States. That's the locale you're going to analyze the past 30 days. And then put in your search terms. And you can see Trump in general it just dominates. And that's the scary thing about the media. If you compare the search term Trump to any other search term, Trump is, it doesn't matter. Everybody just searching Trump every day. That's what it, it's like. It doesn't matter if they like him or they hate him. It's just Trump all day, every day. So Trump uh, dominates, obviously, and these are uh, closer to each other in interest. But you can see North Korea spikes here during the summit. It goes away. And then already an immigration. And that sort of spikes. And again, it spikes with Trump. And then Space Force. I couldn't think of any other topics that were dominating the media. So I thought I would include Space Force. And so this is just for the United States. All right. So this is not Koreans in Korea searching on Google. This is America or people in America, according to IP addresses, uh, searching what terms they search on Google. All right. And you can print that out. It's a CSV. Double check it. Uh, so this is when we talk about media bubbles. Uh, I typed in. This is Tongyeo, Korean for unification, Pukhaning Kwan, which is. North Korean human rights, North Korean human rights and Korean unification. You can see in the US, it says United States, the interest is in North Korean human rights, right? And you can even get it down to the locale. So the interest in North Korean human rights is mostly in Washington, New York, and LA. And for some reason in Atlanta, it's in unification in Korean. I don't know why the results, I'm just showing you how you can use this tool to analyze uh, the different, the way people people's interests all right, are reflected in search terms. And then if you do all around the globe, all right, so this is Korean speaking people all around the globe. The worldwide search term unification dominates the same terms that we put in for the US. You guys understand what's going on there with, with the analysis? All right, so this is Korean speaking people worldwide Typing in Tomeo unification and searching about it a lot more than they're searching for North Korean human rights, free unification in English. In English, it's going to be lower, obviously, and then uh, North Korean human rights right there. Right? So it just dominates. All right, and then if you get into the psychology and what's dominating the, the conscience of the people as a movement, you can start to think about unification as this redemptive dream to reunite the country. And it's a, you know, even the was the Moonies. You guys know about the Moonies? It's called. What's it called though? What's the uh, name of the church? Uh, Korean Korean school, which is like unification. Unification church. church right? It's a very powerful, a very powerful narrative. If you want to get, into. it's a very powerful narrative. All right, move forward. I even want to talk about how in Korean movies and dramas and media that this idea of Korean independence, uh, Korean autonomy, uh, the Korean peninsula uh, is being pushed to have uh, 
this movie at the bottom, I think it's called Kunhando. They're actually piggybacking off the KLA Revolution with this scene. But the movie's about during World War II, I believe. Koreans were impressed into service to work in the mines of this island near Japan. And it's about how they sort of fight to escape the island. But it has to do with the oppression of the Japanese and the fight for independence, basically. Uh, again, in this movie, I really like this movie. It's called uh, Amsal, which means assassination. And it's about the Korean independence fighters. And this says Kwangbo, 70 years. Uh, what's it? What's Memoration movie, right? Uh City Museum. Uh, and so it's a movie about the real history, right? The historical fact. Whether or not it's a historical fact, I'm not here to debate, but I'm talking about what the media is, is, is creating, producing, and what people are watching, and what's in the minds uh, and hearts of, maybe just at least in the context of the Korean population. Uh, there was another movie recently released called 1987, which is about democratic movements, democratic peace movements. Uh, again, so, oh, and this last movie is called uh, Naman Song. Naman San Song. Uh, so it's the South Mountain Fortress, but it's actually just called The Fortress in English. And I'm trying to interpret this movie because if you don't know, uh, North Koreans watch Korean dramas on what are called hotels. Uh, it's a notebook and a television put together. And this is from a pr previous presentation I did maybe like five years ago. But basically, they watch South Korean dramas, and they love South Korean dramas. Do you know what type of drama they love the most? According to some of what people told me, is the historical dramas. Because right? they don't want all that, you know, the uh, Western influence. But movies like Fortress, they might watch and like. And there's a weird, there's a strange message in the movie Fortress, which has to do with the South Korean king uh, has to decide if he's going to submit to the invasion of the Chinese. Uh, so he's basically going to bow down to the Chinese. Or is he going to sacrifice his people let them down? Right? So the invaders that are coming from the outside, are we going to bow down to them? Or are we going to make a deal with them? Or are we going to fight to the death? Is the decision the king has to make. And this just came out in January. It's a famous book, too. I'm going to try to read the book, but I fell asleep when I read Korean. It's exhausting. Eh? There's another good book by Kim Jin Yong. Uh, mm -hmm. which is about the American Korea or America Chinese war to come. Or it doesn't say to come, but it's called America China War. And uh, he's, he's like the Tom Clancy of South Korea. He wrote a book about Thad. He wrote a book about uh, this trade that's going on, the economic fight that's going on. And now Korea is stuck in the middle with this choice to make. Security or, or economic prosperity, is there a choice? What's our choice? What are we going to do? So I'll close with uh, America's Promise, America's Role. I was recently reading a book by Samuel Hawley, written about George Folk, which was the first naval attaché to visit Korea and travel the Korean Peninsula in 18, 1886, 1883-1886. And he spoke about this very problem. Uh, and he basically went crazy trying to solve it. Uh, but he was there with the, as a naval attaché, and he was working with uh, his friends in Korea to try to modernize Korea, and at the time the Chinese dominated the Korean court, and uh, some Korean people that wanted to modernize, they basically partnered with the Japanese uh, coup d'etat, and uh, then you have Japanese occupation for 30 years, Korean War, uh, and then now we're at this, the place where we are now. So I would like to talk about how the United States, back then, we possibly looked the other way and let the Japanese occupy it and let the imperialist, other imperial powers fight over Korea and the U.S. just sort of sat by and watched. And that eventually led to the J expansion of Japan and World War II. And so go, going forward, what is the U.S.'s role in securing providing a security guarantee, because a lot of times people talk about the security guarantee of North Korea. Well, maybe North Korea wants to be under the U.S.'s security guarantee. Right? A lot of people don't actually don't uh, can't imagine the U.S. ever partnering with 
the North, North, North Korea as a security, as an alliance, as an ally. But that might be what the Korean population online or the Korean speaking people might want is a security guarantee for them because they've been fighting with the Japanese and the Chinese for thousands of years. The U.S. is the new variable in the equation. And, uh, you know, I believe that, uh, or at least the U.S.'s role could be to support Seoul, support the Korean people as the new light and the cultural, uh, economic, political leader in East Asia, right? Democratic movements. That can't happen in North Korea, that can't happen in China, that happened in Seoul. And to think that Chinese aren't in Seoul and that North Koreans don't live in Seoul, Russians aren't in Seoul, everybody's in Seoul. It's like Casablanca. All right? And that democratic movement that they did, I mean, it was remarkable, remarkably peaceful. It was a demonstration. And uh, now they've changed directions. And it, you know, it sends signals to everybody else around the region that uh, you know, maybe peaceful democratic movements work. All right, so with that, I want to close. And any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Thank you. Don't get me in trouble. Too much? No questions? Uh, can you touch more on um, Sino South Korean relations following the bad incident last year and sort of how Moon is reacting? Well, how Moon reacted? Which, which, re which, which? Which incident? Uh, the one that you briefly spoke on with. Um, I'm sorry, it's a but I just wanted to. The tablet? Yes. What's Moon doing about it? I don't think Moon cares about the tablet. I think he's happy about the tablet. Okay. Uh, Moon, is, Moon or the Moon administration is going after President Park and former President Park. Uh, I've done talks about that and gotten a lot of angry messages from folks in Korea about, um, I was ashamed, what they say? I was ashamed, I was shameful, because I said that if you, if, if whenever there's an election, this goes for the U.S. too, if you put your political opponents in prison, or if you put people in jail, if you take their wealth, and not just them, their family members and their family family members, and you go after three or four generations, that's a vicious cycle that never ends. Because they're only going to do it to you when you get out of power, and you're not going to be in power forever. So when people look at Xi Jinping and go, oh, why did he stay in power? Why didn't he give up power? Because if he gives up power, he's done. He can't give up power. And so for political stability in any country, you need peaceful transitions of power. And I, I think I spoke about the need for forgiveness. And it would go a long way, I would think, for stability in the political system in South Korea if they show leniency to President Park, whether or not she's guilty or not, just, you know, they don't have to throw the book at her and go after her family and friends. I mean, I have people telling me they're worried about the Moon administration going after assets, right? They want to move assets to the U.S. because of the possibility of this kind of retribution politics. So it is a, it's a big issue. Sorry. Um, so, since you did mention China, I wanted to ask, um, when you mentioned a security guarantee for the Korean Peninsula, um, so that would essentially be uh, a firm alliance between the United States and uh, Korea. So how do you think that um, China would react to that level of American involvement in the peninsula, especially um, if North Korea becomes involved in that as well, because it shares a long border with China? The U.S. already has a security alliance with South Korea. You mean if the U.S. has a security alliance with North, North Korea? North Korea, with the entire peninsula. How would they react? How would China react? Uh, they would not be happy. <laughs> but I think it's an interesting play to say, because North Korea, they don't say, because there's all this worry about defining what's denuclearization mean, what does uh, security guarantee mean, or security blanket mean. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of I mean, I don't come up with ideas. I actually just talk to people and then take their ideas But in, in Korea. But I've been told that it's not too far out of the realm of possibility that North Korea wants a security guarantee from the U.S. against China and Japan. I mean, if you look at it historically, that's the enemy, right? Japan's the enemy in the textbooks. The U.S. is also the enemy. But from what I've 
the rumors or the talk I've heard among academics and researchers uh, if the US I don't know how this would be up to the policymakers to figure that out or how to broach it or how to play it but I do think North Korea actually would like a security alliance or maybe even at least embassy maybe even a US base I know that sounds crazy but Can I follow up on that question? China would not be happy yeah. There would be economic sanctions all over the place, uh, or hidden sanctions on people, but it would, yeah, well, this is the place to talk about it, I guess, so, no, she's, what did you say? Is that it? Okay. I, I was interested in what you said, uh, when you said that uh, uh, U.S. experts uh, uh, need to realize how powerful the, uh, right, right, how powerful the uh, move, movement for peace is. In uh, Korea, you said that right? Yes. Yeah, so, now, so, so my question is this: uh, uh, I've heard a lot of our experts here yeah. at, at, at various forums, right. and actually, it's often the case that someone will raise their hand and say, "Well, look, I live in Korea. You know, I'm, I'm stationed. You know, and, yeah. And, just, and, and you all don't realize what's going on in Korea, blah blah blah." So, the question that I want to ask is. Uh, this seems to be a bad situation then if we have experts here uh, who don't understand this. So therefore, how could you, or what would you suggest uh, could get the correct uh, perception of uh, the feeling for peace in the peninsula? So the experts here, how, how could they be informed? I mean, presumably they spend day and night doing nothing but reading dispatches from Korea. So what, what could be done to yeah. bring them up to speed with the real situation? Because that seems very important that, that they know what's going on. Yeah, I, I often I thought about this as well because of the tremendous reaction we got for basically just saying what Koreans have been saying for a long period of time. But because I was non-Korean and I spoke Korean, then I got sort of a boost and a lot of support. and. Uh, in the U.S., the communities are different, by the way. So the Korean community in Korea, in my opinion, is sort of a different network almost from the Koreans, Americans, or the, the folks that are working in D.C. And their interests are different, obviously, because they are trying to, whatever their interest is, whatever organization they're in, they're, they're trying to do the best for their organization. And then... Same goes with the folks that are in South Korea or in Seoul or working for those media outlets. And the audiences are different, right? So they have to appeal to different audiences. Americans, we, you know, we like to look at North Korean news as long as there's like a missile and a joke about a you know, fat guy or something. So it's just not interesting to us. It's about capturing interest. Uh, how do we get folks to pay attention? That's actually my big fear. You know, it could be one of these... Iranian revolution type deals where all of a sudden the U.S. is the enemy of the Korean people because we ignore the peaceful protests or demonstrations and then all of a sudden uh, you know it, we're, we're stuck in a position where we're, we look like we're the bad guys we're trying to stop it and that's sort of what I try to, to speak to uh, by talk, doing talks like this or, or writing about it because I just worry that you know because of you know, DC is sort of obsessed with itself. It's just thinking about itself. It's only thinking about its interests. Uh, and even in the contracting world or the Defense Department or, the, you know, it's just, I was talking to somebody about they were trying to get a job working for a contractor or whatever. And they were trying to get a position about Korea. And it was that they wanted a PhD with uh, expertise in Korea, spoke Korean, or that was preferred. And what they found out was they didn't get the position because they didn't have a security clearance. And they gave the position that was supposed to help USFK on strategic communications to a Malaysian expert who spoke Malaysian or the Malay. I'm not sure. And the individual had a PhD, and the individual was hired because they were an Asian expert. Right, so Asia is just clumped into one thing for the defense community or the contracting community. So there's a real there is a real disconnect. I don't know how to resolve, I mean, it's one, you know, I think doing more talks, uh, but it's really difficult because the, con the information you consume is in English, and like I tell the students in Mercy Arts, when you read English news, that's for you, right, if you bring up Juma Ilbo in English and in Korean, the articles that are published in English and the articles that are published in Korean are completely different, 
but it's not like they publish it in Korean and then they translate it. They don't. It's completely different because they know that the audience is interested in different narratives. Uh, so that's why I try to make it to tie in with America's promise, you know, the whole self-determination, we're supposed to support nations that want to be independent, that was the big, I used to get criticized, yelled at all the time by folks in Korea, like, hey, you know, you broke a treaty, I don't, I should know the name of the treaty, you broke a treaty or you didn't fulfill a treaty that you signed in like 1905 or something about uh, supporting us uh, security-wise. So issues like this don't go away. But yeah, the, the idea would be to tie it into America's independence movement, right? As, you know, 4th of July, independent liberty. Uh, and then to connect with the Korean uh, people on that level. Right? That would be, maybe that's a story you could tell that would be positive. The U.S. supports peaceful, united, free Korea uh, against the outsiders. mentioned youth unemployment being a major problem in South Korea. You also mentioned that business leaders are optimistic about unification because of the economic opportunities it could bring. Is that a, is that a sentiment that's also shared by the youth? Because there would be concerns around absorbing such a huge workforce into South Korea. Um, so it's not just, I mean, President Park in her Dresden speech said, Tongil Debak. Tongil, unification is pot, jackpot. Or Debak doesn't mean jackpot, it means just awesome or something, right? Uh, but everybody says it, and everybody talks about how great it would be. Uh, but yeah, there are serious concerns similar to the, when West and East Germany uh, unified, and then the West had to, what would you say, absorb the East and all of the stagnation that involved after that. And the, the gap between the North and the South is so large that they're, the experts, the economic experts say that you would need foreign investment uh, to support such a move. Uh, and I think, well, I don't want to talk about that, but yeah, that, that was what you'd have to have a joint you know, sort of kachi gapshida, let's go together attitude and bring up all of the interest groups to the table and then figure it out. But yeah, that would be that would be a bit more difficult, easier said than done when it comes to that. Do the South Korean youth want unification? Uh, there are surveys that people do, and there's all sorts of, uh, you know, Asan Institute, well known institute does surveys of this type, and they report that the youth is not interested in unification like the older generation. And you ask the youth, you say, okay, you don't want unification, right? They say, yes. Is it okay if China absorbs North Korea? And you get like a, hell, hell no, you know, that's not allowed. So there's still the attitude of independence, right, of autonomy from the China and from China and Japan. That's still there. Uh, you can do economic integration in slow steps, and that's actually what any of the economists will tell you it has to be slow integration. They have the DMZ, which is a, they propose peace parks. One of the initiatives is a general friend I know, a South Korean general friend, they run an organization that would remove landmines. So these are joint projects to remove landmines from the DMZ. Or to re, because North Korea has a, a huge problem with deforestation. So these would be joint projects to plant trees. All right, so these would be big sort of government, big government projects. Uh, you know, a lot of times I think leadership or the government or business, what you need is a goal. And you, sometimes you need big goals and big projects. Uh, you know, they, there's a lot to be done. So, sorry. Um, so you said North Korea, uh, I guess from North Korean perspective, you said they want security. But for the U.S., um, U.S. foreign policy role in the region of Northeast Asia is the militarization of North Korea, not the Korean Peninsula, because you know there's a difference between the two. And the previous um, diplomatic efforts to demilitarize North Korea through negotiations have all failed. In like 2003, between Kim Jong Un and then since they outright. So. I'm just wondering um, how this 
peaceful narrative in the between two Koreas is actually relevant to the U.S. Um, security, um, which is with the U.S. or a security alliance and its purpose and its objectives. Great. So the the let me see if I can press this out properly. So Moon, President Moon has just stated that they're going to go on like a historical tour, or they want to go on a tour to visit all these independent sites with North Korea and China, all these places. He's also announced that, I think somebody posted it last night, that they're going to go forward with the peace, he, he said this, I mean, that's a bit, uh, I, I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to address it. My, so I'm going to just, my fear is that the U.S., um, like, like you're exactly correct, you're correct, uh, the U.S., is not focused on, not, not that they don't care, but it's just not the focus, it's not the interest, it's not the purpose of the alliance. The purpose of the U.S. Rock Alliance is to protect South Korea, uh, Japan, and the U.S. from, you know, it's its oldest, uh, you know, the Cold War, right? Uh, from the aggression of the North. And the idea is if there's a peace, then the purpose of the alliance has to disappear, right? Is that sort of the fear? So President Trump said, Trust in Japan, but we can't really trust North Korea. North Korea has been a nuclear arsenal, um, right. and you know, looking at the underground. So I'm guessing whether they're not really sure if North Korean intention is really if they really want to build a peaceful environment or if they're still having another deception strategy. While the Korean, while well, South Korea is building a peaceful narrative, and now they want to kind of propose a um, the ending of Korean War, the ending of Right, right, that's what he spoke about, right. And you're saying how is that relevant to the denuclearization issue? So how do you think we, the inter-Korean relationship, so the inter-Korean relationship mm -hmm. is they're building peaceful near him, but yeah. I don't think that's really relevant. So that doesn't really, so I'm guessing, there's no need to ratify security guarantee because the security guarantee, the precondition for security guarantee for the U.S. is to do the denuclearize North Korean state. Right. North Korea's intention is not really crystal clear. No, we so do not know North Korean intention until because they have hidden their nuclear arsenal underground. So, so I'm one of the folks that is very, very skeptical of North Korea ever denuclearizing. I'm on, I would, I'm a realist when it comes to that. Uh, but also, if you want to put pressure on North Korea, the peaceful narrative is something that they also stake a claim to, right? They also, it's all in their media, you know, unification, get rid of the U.S., peaceful, prosperity of the peninsula, get rid of the outsiders. But I actually don't think North Korea, North Korea definitely doesn't want to open up, right? And they definitely... Um, you know, control information. There's no traveling between regions in North Korea. You have Pyongyang, it's like Hunger Games, right? You have Pyongyang as the capital city. It's controlled in or out. You have the provinces. There's no traveling between provinces without proper papers. Uh, and so I, like North Korea, when I look at North Korea is the, <sighs> President Moon's initiatives Right, for peace. North Korea is not going to turn those down. What the game is, is North Korea is going to try to, what they're doing, what they did to Pompeo recently, right? So the game is this, in my opinion. The game is, we're going to embark upon these peaceful negotiations, and we're going to have these summits, and whoever flinches first is going to be blamed for the breakdown of the talks. And when the U.S. goes in, and Pompeo gets snubbed, or they drive him around all day in a bus, all they want Pompeo to do is explode on television and yell. And then they go, look, angry Americans, you know, peace talks over. And they probably didn't want them to begin with. The thing about it this way is you have like two entities and you're gonna to work together and the eventual goal is to join, then you no longer get your fiefdom. People like their fiefdoms. Right? People like to be king and queen. They don't want to be second king and second queen, or shared king, shared queen. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really worried about uh, anything embarrassing this administration prior to the uh, upcoming elections. Right, so that would be a concern. 
didn't, did I answer it? No, I didn't answer it. I just see it differently, I think. The, the denuclearization issue is the focus of DC. It's the focus of the UN Security Council. It's the focus of the really, really high policy folks. All right? But it, my, the point of the presentation is just to show you that can be your focus, but there's millions of people in Korea that have a different focus. I mean, they don't even, I mean, sorry. I, <laughs> it's just that's not their focus. South Korea China relations? Are they getting better or worse? Uh, just what they look like right now. Well, they have shared culture, shared history. Not the same culture, not the same history, but they have a, uh, I would say that possibly, you know, whether it's diet or culturally or how things, you know, whether it's hierarchy, the way you do the world. Uh, Americans are radically different. Like we're crazy individualists. That's the one thing I learned when I went over there was how individual American culture is. All right, like it's we're actually on the when if Korea is a pretty strong collective society, and I really like that about Korea, and I really like collectivism. Most aspects of it can be tyrannical, but the we've gone a little bit too far out on the individual spectrum, in my opinion, and it's causing problems right now. So they have more in common with the Chinese. The issue is, and I heard, I heard students asking the same question to a Korean professor, they had the same debate, you know, should we dump the US and go with China? China's the future, China has the money. And the professor laughed, he was a professor at Korea University when I was there, and he laughed and he said, well, you know, do you think China's going to be, China actually has a very, very bad reputation with a lot of Korean folks, people. I think one of the, the slurs, I still don't understand the slur, it's called chong nada. Is that a term? Am I getting that right? Chong nada? Huh? It means the dynasty? Yeah. yeah. So there's this idea of China being sort of a brute. Uh, and that, of course, we know Japan was a brute when they had it, their turn to um, work with South Korea, I guess. And so the, the, the professor laughed and just said, you know, the U.S. is probably the best bet you have with being as autonomous, independent, and uh, being as Korean as possible. Because the Japanese, you know, they, they had to cut off the top knot, they had to speak Japanese, they had to get rid of the culture. And anyway, so economically, though, there's a big drive to work with China, because it's about money. So the other side is, we like security, but we also like to make money. Tourism, soft power. Uh, Korean wave goods is all based off of exchanges, whether it's students or tourism or television shows. And if China cuts that off, it really hurts those people, those businesses that are based off of tourism or based off of international students, which is the Korean academic community. Uh, and so there's a there's just a constant, you know, the the when the whales fight, the shrimp get crushed, kind of. It's tough. Um, yeah, I think with Moon, Moon's, Moon's trying his best to balance everything. Uh, but yeah, I, I, don't, I think it's really, it's really, really tough position to be in. But Korean's really good at it, in my opinion. <laughs> Any other questions? Is that it? All right, thank you. Uh,